Well, good morning uh, and thank you. Well, we are very honored and happy today to be welcoming in uh, Professor Inike Klinge from Matrisch University in Holland and the Institute of Gender Medicine in Berlin. Um, if we have about a little bit less than an hour for the talk and then half an hour for question and answers. And if I was gonna introduce Enoch and give her justice, it would take about that time to do that. But I asked, you have all encountered the Gendered Innovation Project and Enoch was one of the co-coordinators together with Londa Schiebinger on this very important project. She is the chair of the Horizon 2020 Advisor Group for Gender at the European Commission and she, <coughs> She has been involved in many European EU projects such as Trigger, Libra, GenMed, and so on. She's also an advisory board member for the Canadian Institute of Gender and Health and the European Institute for Women's Health. And I could go on and on, but I think we all want to hear her talk on the case study too. And I think we will hear a lot about gender and medicine. Inike, over to you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. And thanks to the organizers for the invitation to give a presentation at this uh, gender school. I intend to take you on a trip along new methods for taking account of sex and gender in research and innovation. It's my hope that the methods we developed will be particularly interesting and helpful for you as early stage researchers in the natural sciences and engineering, I understood. So, uh, ah, the organizer, who is uh, putting up the screen or shall I share it myself? Uh, I think you can share it yourself. We've made you a co-host so that maybe that's easier for you, okay. unless you would like us to do it. Uh, I'll try and if not, then we'll switch to. Perfect. Sure. Looks great. There we are. Yep. Okay. Great. Can you see it? Yep. Great. Looks terrific. Okay. So um, let us first consider uh, the state of art concerning the integration of sex and gender in current biomedical and health research. That's my background of training. So far, we have you can say an increased awareness of the relevance of sex and gender factors for research and innovations. And there are all over the world science funding bodies asking for integration of sex and gender analysis as a condition for funding. But it's also true that there is a lack of training in sex and gender sensitive research among researchers and engineers. And then we have had the two gendered innovations projects that indeed provided already field specific methods <clears throat> to integrate sex and gender and to end case studies to illustrate the added value of doing so. But let's go back to how it all started. If you look at this picture of a crowd of people, I would say, and I think you will see a, a, a large diversity of people. I see older people, younger people, women, men, maybe gender diverse people. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, well, this is, I think, uh, what you see when you have in general, a crowd of people. So why is it then that in biomedical research, we only see this one kind of human person? Um, more or less identical, I would say, um, and it's all uh, the young white male of around 70 kilo. So this is the, the standard person um, who is participating in biomedical research. Is that a problem? Yes, it is a problem because around 2000, 10 drugs were taken from the US market because of more and more of because of severe side effects. And of those 10 medications, eight had more and more severe uh, adverse effects in women. So that was a very bad thing and taking a drug from the market costs a lot of money. So what was the explanation behind the, the prevalence of adverse effects in women? Well, the answer is simple because most research 
is done, was done, and still sometimes is done in males, whether in humans, in animal research, and uh, at the level of basic and preclinical research, the sex of the cells did not seem to matter. And you can see in this graph uh, uh, an illustration again from published journal articles within several biomedical fields. You see the proportion of research studies uh, having males, females, both or uh, or where the sex of the participants is not um, uh, indicated. So the proportion of males in blue and females in red, um, in a way, speaks for itself. We see that males from the majority of included uh, participants, except for the field of reproduction, but more worrying than this uh, majority of males included, are the large gray bars. This represents work where no clues are given on the participation, on the participants. So in a way, this cannot be considered excellent research. So we thought that it was time for change and that the one size fits all model of the young white male is no longer um, adequate. It is completely uh, obsolete and for sale and outdated. So uh, now I have uh, mentioned the two concepts uh, already a couple of times, sex and gender. It's time to take a deeper um, look, uh, a more closer look at those two concepts. They have been uh, acknowledged as determinants of health and of course, for, for a long time, we already uh, knew from epidemiological research that there are differences between women and men in the prevalence and mortality of a large number of diseases. So what was needed from uh, behind those epidemiological data are explanations at the basic clinical and behavioral levels. So the two concepts we have, um, are uh, sex, which refers to biological attributes, of humans and animals, including physical features, chromosomes, gene expression, hormones, and anatomy. And we have the other concept, gender, which refers to socially constructed roles, behaviors, expressions, and identities of girls, women, boys, men, and gender diverse people. And it's crucially important to, um, to uh, recognize and to realize that sex and gender are two concepts. They are, cannot be used interchangeably, but in a reality, for instance, in humans, they of course interact uh, during, um, uh, during, during a lifespan. So two concepts, two different concepts, but um, uh, uh, exerting their influence simultaneously. And that is illustrated, for example, in this infographic from the Canadian Institute of Health Research, where you see um, the sex-related aspects depicted on, for me, the right-hand side, and the gender-related aspects on the left-hand side. And you see they come together in this person in the middle. It's also illustrated by uh, this graphic made by my colleague from uh, Charité, by then, Dr. Professor Vera Regitz, where you see um, on the lower part the influence of sex, and at the upper part the influence of gender and gender related behaviors. And you can see that there is already an early influence of gender on biology namely at the level of germ cells through epigenetic modifiers that come from the upper part where you have gender-related influences and they already have an influence on the genes in um, the developing fetus. And then this development, this interaction uh, continues during um, the life course. You have influences during, well, uh, preterm uh, during the germ cell stage, in the fetus, in the child, and in the adult. <clears throat> so um, 
the two concepts, as you see, again, are both exerting their influence and they are also influencing each other. So um, let me now go to this, um, uh, this uh, situation that we have that uh, important science funding bodies are asking for the integration of sex and gender. Um, and, and that they have launched this uh, policy as a condition for funding. So if you want to apply to these science funding bodies, you have to pay attention to sex and gender. So um, which are these science funding bodies? Well, we have the European Commission, which was the first one to ask for integration of sex and gender. They called it integration of the gender dimension already in, uh, since 2002. And then the Canadian Institute of Gender and Health followed in 2010 for all health and biomedical research funded by the Canadian Institute of Health Research. Then in 2014, the NIH in the US followed with similar conditions. And in 2016, just an example from a national science funding body in the Netherlands, we have the Dutch Zonnebe uh, in their gender and health program. So, and, um, and I think these are now four major science funding bodies. I think more science funding bodies all over the world are following uh, these four uh, and are in different stages of development. So why are these science funding bodies asking for integration of um, sex and gender uh, analysis. At the EU level, they say that integrating a sex and gender analysis in research and innovation content helps to improve, sorry, I will put away my telephone. It's always Siri interfering with my, when I'm talking. Okay, uh, so at the EU level, uh, they say that it helps to improve the scientific quality and societal relevance of the produced knowledge, technology, and or innovation. At the level of, uh, in Canada, integration of sex and gender-based analysis plus is about improving the rigor, reproducibility, and generalizability of science. It's about excellence. In the US, the sex as biological variable policy is meant to be a new standard to enhance, again, reproducibility through rigor and transparency and to increase the knowledge base. And in the Netherlands, the science funding body has uh, stated that uh, they, wanted, uh, to, they wanted to introduce this condition to reduce differences in health between women and men by addressing gaps in knowledge. So you see that they have slightly different uh, rationales, but they all um, uh, uh, geared to uh, integration of sex and gender, and for that matter, also intersecting variables. I will return to that. So, um, after this history of starting to require uh, the integration of sex and gender, we have now arrived at um, 2021, where we have in Europe, the new funding program called Horizon Europe. And there we have made two major steps. <clears throat> so this policy has been in development for some 20 years and as that is with policy, it goes uh, slow, it goes step by step, and it knows waves of attention and waves of resistance. But finally, we have arrived here that the integration of the gender dimension into research and innovation content, so the so-called sex and gender analysis, becomes a requirement by default across the whole research program. So that is really a major establishment uh, at the European level that all research um, that has or that wants to be funded by the European Commission has to address sex and gender in the proposal. And that is a really uh, important and, and uh, increasing uh, important step from starting with a stimulation to a facilitation and now to a requirement. 
And the second point is that public bodies, research institutions, and, inst and higher education establishment will be required, starting from 2022, to have a gender equality plan in place. This will uh, enhance sustainable institutional change. I will not say too much about those gender equality plans, but um, gender equality plans also cover participation of women, uh, uh, cover measures against uh, violence, cover, uh, well, all other aspects uh, related to institutional change and uh, in a gender equality plan is also um, included a, a, an action number four to uh, secure um, and, and to also provide training in integration of sex and gender in the content of research. And this is uh, now upon all of us in Europe, all, upon all applicants, but also upon all institutions and research organizations that want to apply at the European Commission. So many are preparing gender equality plans and many are asking for training of uh, uh, their, uh, either their staff or the applicants or evaluators even. So I already mentioned and uh, the two gendered innovations project and the two projects have led to this new requirements now in 2020. Uh, these are um, multinational projects uh, started by uh, the development of a website by Londa Schiebinger at Stanford University and then two times a gendered innovations expert group was funded by the European Commission. Uh, and in this expert group, uh, experts developed uh, the materials uh, in collaboration uh, with um, uh, from experts all over Europe and Canada and the US. Uh, around, I think, 80 experts were involved in the first edition and around 24 in the second edition. So what the, these projects do, they developed state-of-the-art methods for sex and gender analysis because if uh, researchers uh, have in a way, um, become aware that sex and gender are relevant to their research question, then uh, what was lacking was, um, they, they, were, they were willing to do so, but they really lacked methods. So they did not know how to do it. And that's where the method of sex and gender analysis jumped in that gap. But second to the methods, which was, uh, I think, uh, important to convince uh, uh, to convince readers and to convince researchers were case studies illustrating how sex and gender analysis leads to discovery, to new knowledge, to knowledge that would not have been discovered uh, if sex and gender were uh, stayed neglected. And um, from Gender Innovations One, there is a report and you will find it in the resources at the end of my lecture. So after Gendered Innovations One, a number of innovations were introduced in the work programs of Horizon 2020, among which uh, that a number of topics in the work program were gender flagged, were so-called gender flag topics that were topics where it was obvious and, and required or highly uh, probable that sex and gender played a role. So it was expected that applicants would address sex and gender uh, when applying to those gender flagged topics. And this number of gender flagged topics was, uh, of course, monitored during the consecutive work programs. And it appeared that the number of gender flagged topics increased from the first uh, uh, when the first uh, edition of the work program until the third uh, edition. But this uh, interim analysis in 2016 um, already um, made clear that there was room for improvement. There was room for improvement in understanding of the gender dimension, but they also uh, uh, realized, the Commission realized that um, updates were needed, that, uh, uh, that uh, an, as, as an, a new um, edition of gendered innovation should uh, anticipate on new developments, uh, for example, in the field of artificial 
uh, intelligence that maybe the methods could be updated or revised or whatsoever. So uh, a second uh, gendered, uh, gendered innovations expert group was uh, convened in 2018 to, um, to carry out this task. So to revise the methods, to give updates, to anticipate new developments and to develop new case studies. And they should, uh, it was a heavy task because we uh, were also asked to uh, profile the Horizon 2020 successes on integration of the gender dimension. So to make it clear to the research community that integration of such a policy was really a success. And another task was to really gear our uh, policy recommendations to the new clusters and missions of Horizon Europe. So this project was then uh, completed, just, I think, finalized before the corona uh, pandemic in November 2020. Um, and uh, the global website is again uh, 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 located or hosted by Stanford University. And here you see um, a picture of this second report, which is called How Inclusive Analysis Contributes to Research and Innovation, a Policy Review. So there is a heavy emphasis on policy and policy relevant um, recommendations. And here you see <clears throat> the, new, the list of new case studies that we developed, some 15 case studies. And they cover uh, the fields that are covered by the framework programs of the European Commission, which are uh, covering all domains of science. So not only health, because all uh, um, uh, gender innovations and gender medicine started with health domain, but we had to address climate change, energy and agriculture, urban planning and transport, information and communication technology, finance, taxation, and economics. And also, uh, we were asked to uh, produce an ad hoc case study in uh, spring 2020 um, on the COVID-19 epidemic. And um, that was a, a case study that was added to our, uh, our commandment, to our task. Uh, and uh, well, in a way, it was not the most difficult case study to produce because uh, if anything uh, would be uh, demonstrating how relevant sex and gender were to uh, biomedical research, then it was, I think, in the start of the pandemic, where the, the figures for males having more severe infections and dying more often than women because of underlying differences in immunological, immunological systems in men and women were so obvious that no one, well, could in our, in our view, go beyond the relevance of sex and gender, at least for a COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, um, as I said, uh, and, and I think, I hope to be most interesting for you is, I think, a focus on our methods. Uh, I could give many examples, but um, in those examples, the methods we use are most uh, fundamental. And um, in this uh, second uh, uh, edition, we have focused or we have more or less divided our methods in general methods. These are the three methods on this slide. And next to that, we have developed more field specific methods. And of course, that was uh, very relevant in the European situation where we had to cover all these other domains like energy and transport and, and climate and, and agriculture. So the, the three general methods are analyzing sex, analyzing gender and analyzing intersectionality. And they more or less apply to all case studies um, uh, that we have produced or any new emerging case studies. Uh, I don't know if your gender school is also uh, uh, starting in your work to produce some case studies or whatever, or your, well, I don't know what your uh, homework has been, but uh, I think if you, uh, or if you want to, uh, 
uh, to take these uh, materials or these insights into your own research, you will undoubtedly be confronted with the question, is analyzing sex relevant, is analyzing gender relevant, and how to go, to go about with intersecting factors. So there we have analyzing sex. This is a very complex um, slide, and I won't read it to you out all. Um, but it is, uh, uh, it is illustrating that analyzing sex can enhance all phases of research. And what you see in the middle in this circle is the research circle for any uh, research project, which starts with identifying a problem. Then you have to design your research. Then you have to think about how to collect your data, how to analyze your data, what kind of statistics can I use or will I use or are available. And then you have the phase of dissemination of uh, research. So um, it's, it is a, a, a complex picture, but on the way, on the other hand, it's also a very uh, comprehensive a checklist where, for instance, for every pie of the chart, uh, pie of the pie of the uh, the pudding or whatever, um, you have a number of bullet points that will that will make you cons uh, reflect on what should uh, be taken into account when I am identifying my problem. And if you think uh, about uh, sex, does it um, uh, uh, how how does sex relate to my problem? Is it a, a variable? Is it a confounder? Is it uh, something else? Uh, or what is it? Um, is it a covariate, a confounder, or explanatory variable? And then um, is uh, what kind of um, sex-related uh, uh, aspect is relevant to my study are that genetic factors, physiological factors, hormonal factors, biomechanical factors, levels of pain, uh, and uh, how do I take into account uh, interacting factors like gender, ethnicity, age, socioeconomic status, and well, it is hopefully uh, clear to you that in each phase of a research, designing a research project, this is helpful to, uh, to be very conscious about what you are studying, what you are uh, not studying. And of course, you should um, be very clear about if you one way or another choose to uh, this study something only in males or only in females, that's okay. But then you should, um, be very clear in dissemination of your results that this was only studied in male rats or in female rats or in postmenopausal women or whatsoever. And so this is helpful, uh, hopefully, for any uh, starting researcher to uh, make your um, to make your research proposal um, uh, adhering to the conditions now for integrating sex analysis into your research design. And you see here a number of um, uh, uh, references uh, in, in this figure, and these references can all be found on the Gendered Innovations website, where uh, it's a very peer-reviewed checklist. The same we have for analyzing gender. Again, it is relevant in all phases of research and it can enhance all phases of research. And here again, um, if I uh, highlight a couple of bullet points from the first pie chart, um, we have to uh, be very uh, crucial and clear about using the adequate terms for sex and gender. And second, um, gender is a more complex, a much more complex um, concept compared to sex, because gender is a multi-dimensional concept. It consists of gender identities, gender norms, and gender relations. 
So gender identities are about uh, how people perceive themselves and how they are uh, present themselves to others in relation to gender norms. And gender identities might be very context specific and interact with other identities such as ethnicity, class, or cultural heritage. Gender norms are uh, referred to social and cultural attitudes of expectations about which behaviors, preferences, products, professions, or knowledges are so-called appropriate for women, men, and gender diverse individuals. And those gender norms often draw upon and reinforce gender stereotypes about women, men, and gender diverse individuals. So it's very important to be aware of those gender norms, of the workings of those norms, and try to uh, not uh, take them along in your research questions. And gender relations are about uh, relations uh, between uh, people and uh, between people and institutions on an institutional level. So paying attention to gender is um, uh, can be subdivided into uh, am I addressing identities? Am I trying to evade normative uh, stereotypes? Or are gender relations at stake? And that will help you to make your research proposal very clear how you uh, uh, conceptualize and how you operationalize uh, gender. And then, of course, we have the intersecting factors again. And then you go again through the whole circle, and in the end, you will have a perfect uh, integration, have done your utmost. Uh, best to uh, be uh, conscious about how to integrate sec a gender analysis in your research. The third uh, general uh, method is th the newest one. It was already in an early stage in Gender Innovations 1, but this is an increasingly um, more important uh, method. It's also that the Commission now, uh, as the title of our second report, it has an inclusive analysis. And in the first one, it was including sex and gender analysis. And now it's explicitly about including or describing, uh, uh, including overlapping or intersecting categories such as sex, ethnicity, age, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, and geographical location that combine to inform individuals' identities and experiences. It's, it's uh, an important one, and it seems complex, but of course not always all intersecting categories are as relevant as sex and gender. And in some, uh, for some research questions, uh, socioeconomic status might be more important than gender. And uh, that will be, in the end, a matter of carefully uh, uh, weighting your uh, assessment of which intersecting factor you um, are able to take into account in your proposal. So let me now make all this uh, abstract uh, work a little bit more um, telling by showing you uh, some case studies. I've chosen case studies from biomedicine because that's my background and I'm most familiar with them. But I also made a uh, small excursion to the field of agriculture. And uh, so uh, we will, I will show you a case study from clinical research about chronic pain, about public health research, about the field of nutrigenomics, about uh, agriculture, and in the end, I will refer, but not explain in detail, some uh, uh, case studies we have developed on um, uh, implying artificial intelligence technologies. That may be more interest for you as engineers, I don't know, but um, you will find case studies on the website. So this case study on chronic pain, First, I would say um, there are sex-related aspects uh, of pain signaling. As you can see, pain signaling goes via different pathways. When a peripheral uh, injury occurs, 
leading to the perception of pain in the brain, we see that different types of cells are involved in women and men. T cells in women and microglia in men. And in specific situations, these pathways can switch. You see it here that in males lacking testosterone, they switch to the female path. And females that lack T cell or that are pregnant switch to the pathway, the pathway of men. So a better understanding of these sex-related mechanisms might help to design sex-specific pain treatments. But analyzing gender is also relevant here. Women and men are raised to express pain differently. Men get messages to be tough, not to show pain. So gender stereotypes, gender stereotypes can so influence how pain is experienced a patient's willingness to report pain. It's obvious that men are less willing to report pain of, uh, to a doctor and especially to a female doctor and how healthcare professionals manage pain. Women, for example, are more often referred for psychological treatment than for pain treatment. A second uh, example is from uh, um, the field of non-communicable diseases. And we want to understand the risk factors for non-communicable diseases. What are non-communicable diseases? That are diseases like cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes type 2. And these, those diseases are primarily caused by preventable risk factors and are causally linked with four particular behaviors. Behaviors like tobacco use, physical inactivity, unhealthy diet, and the harmful use of alcohol. And scientists estimate that elimination of modifiable risk factors, such as that unhealthy diet, physical inactivity, and tobacco use, would prevent 80% of premature heart disease, 80% of premature stroke, 80% of type 2 diabetes, and 40% of cancer. So these case studies uh, illustrate the method, how sex and gender interact. Integrating <clears throat> sex and gender analysis into a life course approach can reveal how sex and gender related factors interact to influence development of non-communicable diseases. The diagram shows the relative influences of sex related factors in the lower half, the blue one, and gender-related factors, which together determine a person's disease risk over his lifetime. Importantly, in the upper half, social, gender-related social factors, such as obesity or lack of exercise, interact with sex-related biological factors in the lower half, such as genetic predispositions, birth weight, and hormones, <clears throat> to determine how well a person ages. And you see again that gender related social factors are already influencing their influence a very early in fetal life, where you see that the, 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 the yellow bar reaches the bottom line in fetal life. But how can we understand women and men's different obesity rates? If we then look to uh, gender differences in lifestyle, style, then we find answers. Perhaps gender norms in society lead men to exercise more than women, and this can lead to greater disease among women. Or perhaps gender norms in society lead men to eat less healthy food than women, and this gendered behavior can lead to greater disease among men. And so you see that all these behavioral risk factors are subject to uh, current gender norms, and because norms can be changed, these behaviors are changeable and a change would favor a better health outcome. My next example is a small excursion to a different field, the field of agriculture. It was new in a gendered innovations two project, but it was an interesting uh, uh, case study in its own. Because um, 
gender-related cultural and religious expectations prohibit women in rural Bangladesh from harvesting fish, even from their own ponds. Such tasks are seen as the responsibility of men. Women are also reluctant to enter ponds because they get their, their clothes, their series wet. To support gender equality and to ensure food security, a project called World Fish introduced gill nets in the poorest parts of Bangladesh. Gill nets are a kind of uh, technology, new technology. It's a particular form of nets with uh, very small mazes, which catch uh, small fish. And this project combined the introduction of a new technology with a gender transformative approach. The nets, which women can make themselves, are used to catch the nutrient-rich mola fish. Crucial to the success of this project are initiatives addressing gender consciousness to ensure that husbands, in-laws, and neighbors supported the new role of women in cultivating and catching fish with gill nets. So the method to this transformative method is, is a, a method developed by this project, which is about having groups discussing the roles and trying to, um, to, to take uh, women, husbands, uh, neighbors, religious persons uh, in, um, in, in uh, a new perspective on gender roles, which in the end um, uh, secures uh, a better food supply and it promotes a gender uh, equality. So the method called gender transformative is about fostering the critical examination of gender roles, norms, and relations done in, in groups, and recognizing and strengthening positive norms that support equality, promoting the position of women, girls, and marginalized people, and also by doing so, transforming underlying social structures, policies, and broad beliefs that perpetuated gender um, inequality. So this, I think this project was successful. And in, uh, in the end, women were able to catch their own fish and securing food for the family and gaining some autonomy that was acceptable for their husbands and the environment. Because the husbands could go on with fishing uh, larger fish with their nets and going on with uh, selling those fish on the market. And women, on the other hand, uh, acquire some autonomy by fishing their own fish and uh, providing food for their family and even raising some money. So um, a very interesting uh, uh, example of how introduction of a technology can change gender norms. Um, gender innovations too also include several case studies on, with a focus on art, artificial intelligence technology like machine learning. And there's a case study on facial recognition, on extended virtual reality and on virtual assistants and chatbots. And field specific methods used in those case studies are for example, analyzing gender and analyzing intersectionality. Underlying main problem in all these case studies was the training of the algorithm in a too narrow population of data. For example, in facial recognition systems, uh, they were um, not very well able to identify faces of darker skinned people and darker skinned women were the least um, uh, detectable faces by the first editions of facial recognition systems. Awareness of this problem happily has been created and improvements have started, for example, for facial recognition. I will not go into these case studies in larger detail, but they can all be found in full detail in the publication and also on the Stanford website. And I really would advise you to, uh, if you have not done it already, I don't know, to visit the website and to try and use the methods and, and learn from the uh, case studies uh, uh, presented there. They are uh, really um, 
made very uh, user friendly and you can pick up uh, what you like to invest in. Uh, you don't have to do them all, but you just uh, choose the ones closest to your interest or to your intended proposal. My take home message would be that an inclusive science, and that's what the, the, the major um, movement now is in science and engineering to be inclusive, to be uh, relevant and as good for all kinds of people and not just for white males. An inclusive science needs innovative research methods, meaning that excellent research considers sex, gender, and social, social position, such as age, um, ethnicity, sex, sex, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, and so on. So um, there's also, uh, the, the, I think the development has been to uh, increase the number of women in the technical sciences and in engineering. Uh, but I, my opinion is that adding more women is not enough. If women uh, perform science and engineering in the old fashioned way, then we will not have innovation. So we need two things, a uh, larger participation of women, but most crucial is that all uh, uh, researchers and engineers uh, apply innovative research methods. So it's the methodology that counts. And for, I think for the future, all stakeholders are needed, researchers, research financers, peer reviewers, journal editors and educational curricula. And in this respect, I think the gender school is fulfilling its uh, large um, need in uh, education. So these are some resources from the Gender Innovations Project and from Europe. And other resources are as good uh, as the European ones and some even more detailed, the Canadians, for instance, and uh, the US who has really invested in basic uh, biological research um, for you to uh, have as resources at hand if you uh, are continuing your career. Thank you. That was what I would like to share with you. Thank you so much, uh, Inike. Let's see, maybe if you stop sharing, we can see yep. people. Uh, and uh, we have a number of questions in the chat already. And one of the first, which is always the first one, will you make your slides available for us? <laughs> yes, of course. No problem. I, I even I even uh, understood that the, the session was recorded. So, but mm. the slides are available, of course. Yep. That's grand. So uh, the first question here is, uh, how would you evaluate the impact of gender innovation on policy, ex example, research policy and health policy, et cetera? And what future do you foresee for gender innovation with new fields, new perspectives, approaches, et cetera? Well, I think um, gender innovations, the two, uh, the, the work of the two experts group has has definitely has a had a, a a big impact on the the new research policy under Horizon Europe, but that was, of course, because of the materials developed, but also the close collaboration with the gender unit in the DG Research and Innovation. They um, uh, they were very uh, interested and motivated to make the the work of the expert group a success, and they have, I think, done a large inside uh, awareness creation among their colleagues, uh, among the highest levels, uh, reaching out to the, uh, the commissioner for science, uh, for research and innovation. So I think at the European level, it has had a big impact. Uh, and then uh, of course you want to, well, my personal uh, um, question has been, uh, if we have this progress, uh, uh, at the European level, why are not all member states in Europe, for instance, following? So uh, that is, well, still an unanswered question, but now it has been made more uh, compulsory to produce gender equality plans and that uh, the, the requirement to address um, uh, sex and gender analysis uh, as a default uh, 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 
condition. Uh, I think that member states will raise their um, efforts to um, also uh, influence and uh, uh, make similar uh, policy, uh, give similar policy guidance to uh, national uh, institute, national research uh, organizations, etc. They will have to. Uh, so there are already good examples in Ireland, in Norway, in Germany, uh, in the Netherlands for a little part. Uh, but um, Italy, I think, also. So um, we will see. And then, uh, well, they don't have to invent the wheel, uh, I would say. <laughs> uh, just uh, use the genetic innovation method. And maybe, uh, of course, uh, transporting a, a policy from one place to another needs an adaptation to national policy systems, etc. cetera. So um, those countries were the government would be influential in guiding uh, ministries and science policy, those will have the biggest chances. Is that an answer? For me, it is, yes, the, when it comes to new fields, uh, will the, uh, you have an impressive number of fields where you have a case studies and so on, would you, do you foresee that some of the more resistant fields will also be included in, in this project or in, in following up? Mm -hmm. in, it, well, it, it depends on what you call a resistant uh, fields. I know fields which have been difficult to, to reach. And of course, there are still some fields uh, where I cannot find of any gender related aspect, for instance, in mathematics or in space research or whatever. So uh, I think um, apart from those fields, uh, I think within biomedical and health research and especially public health, which is for a large part about behaviors, um, there will be, uh, uh, well, I think there will be, uh, the, the insights will be growing that that it's relevant and in which way it's relevant. There are, I think, some um, uh, promising uh, uh, promising experiences I see from the interest of young researchers in uh, biomedical and health sciences. Uh, uh, we, we have seen them in the, in the program funded by the Dutch Science Foundation um, to be really uh, uh, enthusiastic and, and trying to uh, to implement it uh, in uh, questions around different uh, fields of biomedicine. Um, um, that's one. So I see, I see hopeful, uh, hopeful developments there for the more technical um, fields. Uh, uh, well, I think uh, any, any developer um, will want its product or his or her product to be used by, I think, uh, uh, um, the largest amount of people, unless you produce something especially for women or for men. So uh, in the design of a technology, and there's also a, a method on designing technology, uh, you will have to take account of the needs and preferences of your end users. So for any technologies, there's an end user. So there's maybe not so much um, um, uh, uh, biological things, although uh, involved. But um, if the if the end user is a human, then uh, it could be that sex related aspects and gender related uh, uh, influences are crucial to the development. Uh, Sarah, was that uh, answering your question, or do you want to follow up? <laughs> Okay, so Mary Lou, maybe it's best you you answer you, you ask your question directly because you're next in the list. So, <laughs> um, a, a little bit of a coming from a, a, a you know the devil's advocate perspective. Uh -huh. I, I wonder, I, I wonder, is there any uh, acceptable excuse or valid reason to not include uh, sex and or gender? I mean, is there I mean, I'm just anticipating resistance, basically, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I go, you know, wander toward the engineering and natural sciences uh, faculty a little bit. 
Um, and and I'm just wondering if there if there really are any valid excuses. I, I don't see one, but I'm you know I'm curious what you think about that. Well, one uh, first of all, um, if for uh, if you can demonstrate that there's already established research which has demonstrated that there is no difference, then of course you uh, can uh, take the, you can start from there, um, and. Um, and it is um, uh, um, if if you take into account a sex analysis. So it doesn't mean for each project that you have to include men and women. So uh, if if something has been settled for men, then you can study it in women, or uh, and and also in. Uh, but that's not your field. But in more basic. Um, uh, basic uh, biological research, the resistance has been, okay, then we have to include uh, the double amount of animals, the double amount of money, etc. And um, especially the, the NIH in the US has uh, countered that argument by very sophisticated uh, counter arguments that it's not always about doubling numbers or doubling um, Money. And if you need some more money to uh, really uh, find the answer, then you can ask for that. So then money would not be a limitation. Um, yes, I think uh, there are acceptable, uh, you, you can imagine of exceptions, but uh, you have to be very, um, uh, very precise and very uh, good in your argument. It, it, it seems to me that the maybe the lesson here is that um, we have to avoid assumptions. Yes, I mean, we can't. Yeah. I mean, that, that I mean, at its most basic, we just can't pretend anymore yeah. that there's one kind of person or, or being or, or cell yeah. or yeah. or that yeah. just sex and gender don't exist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that one can stand in potentially for for the other. Um, I mean that that seems to me so that even as you said, even if there are no differences, then just say that there are no yeah. differences, yeah. or be clear that we only looked at X or Y. I, I told this story the other day in gender school. <laughs> I was doing a literature review on COVID nineteen research regarding uh, well being and mental <laughs> health related <laughs> issues, and I was shocked to the extent yeah. that nobody addressed the issue of sex or gender. I mean, just like, I mean, it's well-being, it's mental health. It just seems so obvious to me. Yeah. Yeah. And yet, I mean, there were so few, with the exception of the issue of domestic violence, yeah. um, there was almost no um, addressing of that issue, just the assumption that either people had better, some people had better well-being, some people had worse well-being or mental health, so on and so forth, but no uh, addressing of, of sex or gender, which was amazing to me. Yeah. No, that's 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 really disappointing because when um, the, the the pandemic exploded and all res, uh, resources for research were switched to COVID nineteen research, and at, uh, at the EU at the EU level we uh, we made a kind of statement also asked from by the gender unit to uh, all this large amount of money that now went to. Um, uh, COVID-19 research to uh, uh, to address sex and gender and, and very little was seen in reality and also now you see that um, uh, uh, research has become uh, published that there is no um, splitting out of men and women not even in vaccine development etc so that's very disappointing the other thing you say is that the the the, the, the bottom line lesson is that this extrapolation from a small group of people and assumptions about how it should be uh, are extrapolated to the rest of uh, humanity, to women, men, children, to women, children, the elderly, and people of ethnic diversity is uh, is is not scientific. It's it's it has no no nothing to do with any radical feminism or whatever so you could debunk it but it's just about scientific excellence and let me tell you a an anecdote um countering resistance from well some uh, person i think a professor in belgium i had been 
giving a talk, etc. And then um, uh, the answer was uh, that um, uh, he said, uh, well, um, you haven't shown that is, uh, 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 you haven't shown that it is uh, yielding benefits for women, uh, introducing, I think, um, uh, being more attentive to uh, the, the symptoms of cardiovascular disease. And then, okay, I could say, uh, well, there are so many re uh, results already and there are handbooks, etc. But then uh, it, it took me some time to, to really come up and prepare a good answer because it was obvious that he would never, from his perspective, read all that literature, etc. because uh, why should he? He was just mentioning it. But I think the best answer is you haven't proven that it worked in women. So... Okay, and then he said nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would just like to make a, br a brief comment. You, you mentioned, I think you said space science and mathematics would be maybe, but uh, there is even there. <laughs> I can recommend the recent study on, on from NASA and, and planet, planet excursions, not excursion, explorations. Okay. Where it's called shaping science, where they actually look at how the compositions of the research groups actually uh, makes the science. Uh, so it's very fun. The, no one can be completely immune. So yes, the little yeah. comment. I do not understand it completely. Do you want a, a, a hierarchy in methods or maybe I'll look up your question in the chat. Oh yeah. Why we choose a method and lasting season for our research? How should we determine it? Yes, yes. Um, um, it, it's very much uh, uh, dependent on uh, what what is the research question that you are addressing. So, uh, and you have uh, uh, well you are a researcher, so something has spurred your curiosity that you want to know, ah, how is this in maybe women uh, with from a lower uh, socioeconomic background? So then, because you have figures or you, uh, for instance, know that they have, um, uh, that they resist uh, vaccination, something or uh, and then uh, from your research question i think it's already obvious on what you would uh, focus in the first place and of course there maybe in the second phase you address another factor but from your research question it's it's uh, it, it guides you to um to choose your method that would be my answer okay thank you Thank you. Uh, Sebnem Esses, would yeah. you like to ask your question? <laughs> uh -huh. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, hi, Professor Klinger. I am a, um, I work at the field. I do try to do drug design at molecular level, but I've never been to clinical trial or animal studies. Um, my question is like, instead of leaving it to nations, regulations, stuff like that, why don't we control it with the publications? Like, <laughs> my question yeah, yeah. was like instead of guidelines sager guidelines for instance why yeah. don't we say sager rules well uh, that, <laughs> that depends on our uh, our lobbying uh, activities uh, uh, with those uh, science uh, with those editors and uh, well the, the sager guidelines are a first step <clears throat> there are <clears throat> some really um good science, uh, science uh, uh, there are some really good journals who are, uh, uh, have been sensitive to these guidelines like uh, uh, the Lancet and like um, science. And um, we are yeah, still working with uh, influential editors to, uh, to, to influence those editorial boards. Uh, on the on the gendered innovations website, you can find a real list of what different uh, journal editors are doing. So what their policy is and what specific questions they are asking. But um, that um, more could join the, the good examples that there are. Yeah, it is. Uh, <laughs> it is more like uh, suggestion than. Uh 
regulation, right? At this point, that is my concern. But you are right; we cannot make all the editors. Uh, no, 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 and and there's no. I think there's no overarching uh, uh, institute or whatever that can uh, that can guide uh, uh, journals into a certain direction. It is. Um, um, no, I, no, they, they, they really have to, to take on the challenge themselves. I see. My second question is like, uh, I don't want to raise any uh, suspicion or anything, but I'm now noticing, for instance, for the side effects of this vaccination, uh, there's a change in the menstrual cycle and people start to report this. There are like 30,000 people in UK and just from my environment, like from my friends, I'm hearing this. And <laughs> since we know the past about the drugs, uh, I'm really scared right now because like, I feel like there is no scientific report really. So just be quiet. But then you know the past and you're like, probably like uh, the side effects are coming late. And this COVID is like in a panic. So, but what do you know stuff about that? Uh... Yeah. Well, it is a well. I, I share your concern, and uh, it's 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 um, well, it's it's hard and it's painful to to see this again as as a consequence of not taking into and of not. Uh, um, uh, taking into account the difference between women and men in developing a vaccine. And uh, I know this uh, example of uh, menstrual uh, distortions and I think colleagues in, and as you, in the, in the U, uh, U, UK also, but in, the minor, in my country, um, mm -hmm. um, they are trying to, uh, to put up a research into this, but it's, um, it's, it's a pity and it's so stupid <laughs> because uh, if, if anything uh, uh, and any uh, thing is more obvious than it are the differences between women and men in immunological system that's known for a long time and then in developing an, a vaccine then it in my view it will be the first thing to take into account but unfortunately and some people, that's some people where, need to wake up <laughs> yeah but like people cannot relate that is the issue since there is no warning like there is nothing about that they see these changes but they cannot relate it like uh so it's like a living experiment really in the yeah, society yeah. now like yeah. we are telling to each other oh it is happening to me also stuff like, yeah. it is interesting like uh they should be at least a little warning about that like yeah there might be some side mm. of Anyway, <laughs> that was Step another now. question. Maybe this uh, is your your next article project. <laughs> just yeah, yeah. Idea. I just want to put that out there. I'm going to go from molecular to clinical. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Okay. Tomas, yeah, can, can, Marilyn, I, can, I, yeah. I, can I follow up again? Um, I totally agree with that. It, it just seems so obvious that you would look at... Um, sex i mean even sex i mean okay let's gender let's just forget about gender altogether it just seems so basic on so many levels for so many different fields and yet there's so actual little i don't want to be too negative but there's so little publication that actually integrates a sex gender perspective i mean i think she figures we were looking at this the other day less than two percent of publications, you know, through the EU are actually integrating a sex or gender perspective. And despite a 20 year effort on the part of the EU, and I, I, I wonder, you know, kind of going to Shebnam's, uh, you know, issue of requiring people, and now we're moving on to gender equality plans. Um, I just wonder, can we really force people? I mean, is that really going to work? Is it going to backfire on us? That's kind of one part of it. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, is I wonder also sort of what the real resistance is to integrating sex and gender. It's just not that hard some of the time. I mean, some of the time it is really hard, mm -hmm. but on some level, it's also just not that hard. It's a really basic question and so many people don't even ask the question is there a difference let alone getting into the more complex issues of 
gender and intersectionality and different, you know, differences in that regard. So I guess I'm a little stuck there. Maybe you have some thoughts. It wasn't a very well worded question. So my apologies. That. No, but it's, it, it's, it's, I share your uh, concern and your, uh, uh, you get a little bit uh, 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 asking, so why doesn't it move faster than, 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 than it goes? And um, well, of course, then um, there the, the, some resistance will will stay and will stay uh, because um, any innovation. And but, but then you should in, look. Maybe the answer is somewhere in uh, theories about innovation because uh, the the vested uh, interests of researchers who have high positions and have done work for years and years and have. Uh, many rewards, etc. Um, if there's some someone and says, uh, "Okay, uh, this is you, you, you," they feel attacked because you, in a way, say um, your research was not as excellent as it could be, or if you if you are unpolite or are uh, you say your work was uh, rubbish because, yeah, of course, that's not the way to say it. But it's difficult for um, established researchers to uh, to take on board something new because they experience it, it as a critique of their own work. While instead, if they would embrace it as an innovation and as of increasing insight, developing insight, which is happening everywhere with your telephone, with your electric car, etc. So why? be so conservative and and well that's i think the difficulty with established researchers so on the other hand and that's where i uh, keep um, my enthusiasm uh, uh, lively is from young researchers who encounter these innovative methods these new developments in well in an, some stage in their um, uh, training to be a researcher and um, I see that, and, and I've been uh, uh, telling them that as a kind of promise, um, here are new ways of doing research, which will allow you to create your own research line. So the depart from your supervisor or whatsoever, you can never be as good as he or she, but this is a way to, um, to make new knowledge, which is non-existent, which you will, uh, which will, you will be the first to publish on this, um, and then, uh, and I think uh, I feel that it appeals to young researchers. At least I have a group of young researchers in the Netherlands. I see it everywhere. So, um, no more, no more speculations about uh, resistance. <laughs> Thank you. But about the resistance, just one question. You have such a great insight in the inner life of the European Commission. Also, uh, the, the, one of the resistance you meet sometimes is that yeah, all this is good, but in the end, in the evaluation committee, it will not really be uh, taken so seriously. Could you could you comment on that? Do you feel that the push is really that this is going to be lived? Yep. Not a, uh, and and really enforced in the in next year, so to speak. Well, there's uh, a couple of things to say uh, to this topic. First, um, it it started with making tools for researchers, uh, but the, in a second step, uh, if those proposals are to be evaluated, uh, you want from evaluators that they can um, judge or assess if the applicant has um, integrated sex and gender adequately in the right way. So in a way, evaluators have to be more skilled than applicants. Um, that's one thing. Uh, and um, if uh, at least at the European level, uh, there, the kind of application forms and evaluation forms are all standard and you can be, um, a proposal can be elevated on uh, excellence, impact, and uh, and something else. Uh, no, um, uh, scientific quality, impact, and actually, no, uh, on three levels. But um, <clears throat> that is, in a way, also dependent on how 
on the questions on the evaluation form or the questions that can be asked when an evaluation committee is meeting in Brussels. If um, there is no explicit question on has the gender dimension being addressed in this proposal, then it was, and that is uh, th that were the experiences from uh, colleague uh, gender experts who participated in those panels, then no one raised the question about the gender dimension, how it was addressed. Um, and, uh, and then the, the gender expert usually had to raise her hand, okay, uh, can we also give uh, some points or can we discuss how well the gender dimension was addressed and that 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 led to difficult situations and they felt uncomfortable because they were the only person asking for uh, this uh, comment and so now we have uh, so we have argued for and it has been implemented in some part uh, that there is a compulsory question in an evaluation form how the gender dimension uh, can be uh, has to be uh, uh, how the gender dimension has been addressed and you, you can give points for that. So uh, I think that is a, a big step forward that it is legitimate to ask the question and that it is part of the total score. And uh, we also argued for giving a, for a good address some extra points, but they have not implemented that. And uh, connected to that is that uh, we also need to train the evaluators. Evaluators also are um, established researchers and uh, part of the evaluation is uh, done online. So they uh, have to uh, go through a kind of online presentation and, um, and in the end they come together as evaluation committee in Brussels, of course, not the last two years. Um, and then uh, we also propose that evaluators should be trained in a way uh, uh, on uh, the gender dimension, what it is and how it should be uh, assessed. But the answer, the inside answer so far has been evaluators, these are established experts and they don't see themselves as in need of any training. So uh, that's difficult to impose something on them. Uh, but it can be done. And the example is the, uh, the situation in Canada, where uh, the director of the Institute for Gender and Health has made large efforts to uh, introduce a kind of uh, training for peer reviewers. And you will find the link to that video uh, in, in the resources are provided to you. Um, and that means that, um, uh, and that's an, an, an very, uh, peer reviewer friendly training it's only it, it's very short but it uh, goes through all the essentials of what is a good address of sex what is a good address of gender and then you could uh, score it as adequate good or excellent so a kind of ranking and uh, for uh, uh, peer reviewers now to participate in an evaluation they have to comply that training so I think it's one step, and I would love to see something in uh, at the level of the European Commission. At the European Commission, so far uh, in the evaluated training, there has now been an included. There has now been included a training or a video to um, to uh, uh, to avoid uh, uh, unconscious gender bias. But that's more about the person who is. Uh, asking uh, the proposal or who's proposing and not so much about the content of the proposal. So maybe that's something for the next year. Well, yeah. Okay, uh, we have no more questions. So on that hopeful note, thank you so much, Ineke. And uh, I guess we do some sort of a Zoom applaud. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you for participating.